Greetings, and welcome to the Open-Minded Skeptic Podcast. My name is Sharon Ann Rowland, and I'm your host. Today on our podcast, I will be sharing some highlights from an interview I did with Beth Darlington of Access Paranormal last June. Beth is a lively and passionate paranormal investigator. Her ambition is to provide relevant and actionable educational information for paranormal investigators around the globe through online learning. With her own story starting out like many others, finding information about hauntings is easy enough, but then what? Beth has training and development qualifications, as well as being a mental health first aider, a student of the School of Parapsychology, and with over 10 years investigation experience. Beth also enjoys traveling around the world, speaking at paranormal conferences, most recently at Scarefest in Kentucky, that's the USA, and as part of a panel at Skepticon in Sydney. Let's do this. Now, the big question, how old were you when you had your first experience with the paranormal? If, if you, um, yeah. mm-hmm. And was this experience the trigger that led you on to your current career path or was it a mentor of some type instead? Did somebody else get you into this? Oh, um, I was about 16 um, and I was uh, visiting my dad in Perth. He had a beautiful old house that even back then, and I'm talking, I'm a little bit older than 16, got a few decades, um, and this uh, particular house uh, back then was about 140 years old, which is quite old for Australia. Beautiful old building just out of Perth, uh, about an hour's drive of Perth. And um, I was always interested, always been interested in ghost stories, always interested in the afterlife, um, and all equally as interested in how people can pick up information about other people they would never have previously known. So which obviously is mediumship or psychic ability, but I didn't really, you know, I kind of knew those terms, but it just fascinated me. And um, I was asleep in the room with my sister at night and my dad had uh, painted the whole house um, because he was redoing as a bed and breakfast, beautiful old building. Um, And he'd painted all the walls and it cost a fair bit. But of course, you know, we're waiting for the paint to dry a little bit. And and obviously we had, you know, we were visiting and, and the paint, you could still smell it. And at night time, I was lying there and I heard this sliding sound and it was like, and it just kind of hit hit the ground, bang. And I it woke me up. It was so loud, but I could hear this, the whooshing sound. I thought, what's that? I didn't really think much of it. And I kind of rolled over and went to sleep. It was a bit weird. And then next day at breakfast, I said, oh, Dan, you know, um, I heard one of the pictures fall off the wall. I think we're going to have to find out which picture it is. And he kind of just chuckled. He said, there's no pictures. We've painted the house painted inside there's no pictures my god must have been you know from somewhere because well let's just have a look i'm like all right so we went look around there was nothing nothing was out of place nothing had moved and it was a a large object it wasn't something that was maybe a picture frame a smaller one it was a really large uh, sound it sounded like a really large picture frame and i kind of thought Uh what's going on here it's an old house and you know downstairs in the basement which was the original part of of the house was half underground because a it was a lot cooler and B, during the time of when the, the, the village and the whole town was settled, there were hostile Aborigines that were around. And so having it half underground, you you kind of half concealed. And it just had this feel about it. I look back now and think, mm-hmm. oh, if only I could go through that place with the eyes that I have now. It would be amazing. Yeah. But <laughs> it's just so, yeah, that, but that really spurred it on. But it was only up until I moved to the UK where I really started to get involved and realised it could be something. And in the UK... The paranormal is massive. It's huge. And yes. I was very, very mm. spoiled. Yes. Yes. No, well, I mean, look how everything there is like, you know, 2,000 years old. So like walking around London, I went back in, I was actually born in England and um, I went back in 2006 and spent a couple of weeks just looking around London. And the, you know, every everywhere I went, there was, you know, I... I'm I'm going to admit this. I am a wuss, Beth. And the moment any <laughs> shit goes down, or I get a, a something down the back of my spine, I go with my senses. I do the whole flight. 
I don't do this fight shit. I just like I run for it as fast as possible. And if 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 they want somebody, I'll trip somebody on the way out. So mm. that, so I can get away before then. <laughs> I was like that in the so, beginning. <laughs> so well, I did I did something up here on um, the USS Di no, the US Di Mantina, which is in South Bank. Um, there's an old uh, naval ship. And I, it was, I was, I was so set. I was going to do this. You know, it's going to be a four-hour investigation. I went in down the ladder. Two seconds later, I'm up that ladder and I'm in the pub. And I just <laughs> said to everyone from the top, "Come when you finish, come and see me in the pub over here." Because the moment I, I didn't even spend ten seconds. Because the moment I got in there, I sensed like a lot of bad. I call it bad juju. And I thought, no, I'm not staying here. <laughs> and I got straight out. So um, one day I should try and be a bit braver and actually see what would happen if I stayed in, you know. Same with the Boggo Road one. I, I went into one of the cells there with Rick and his team and somebody got slapped by something and scratched. And that was enough for me. I was right, <laughs> I, was out, I was out the front in like 10 minutes <laughs> with the bags back. So, so, yeah, not very brave, but... um. Mm. Well, that's that's fascinating. Um, so, w where else in the UK? Where in the UK were you based? Was it somewhere very old, like um, oh, like Bath, or was it London, or somewhere else? I would I would have loved it if it was in Bath or Oxford. They're oh, just yeah. beautiful, beautiful towns. Um, it was actually in London, but I mean, you have you having been there? It was Zone Three of the Tube of London, so it's kind of just out oh, of London okay. sort of thing. So, I, you know, I was living there for two years, um, and so every every once a month um, on a weekend, I would make my trek out to, you know, up, up Warwickshire or, you know, so sort of down to Kent or anything like that to, to actually go to these paranormal investigations all around the country. And, you know, you have this opportunity to be able to investigate Tudor manors and, you know, uh, London yeah. tombs, you know, and, and you're, you're, you're sort of in, in sort of tunnels that are, uh, are underneath plague pits. And just things um, like this that, you know, this is what I was introduced to and I came to Australia and it was just like, oh, wow, I realised how spoiled I was. It's just yes, not to take away the, what we have, but it's just a whole different experience when you have that to deal with. Yeah. So it's all different places, so many different locations. Winston Churchill War Rooms was one I was able to investigate. That's how I spent my oh. Valentine's Day. <laughs> just, <it's> a, <laughs> That's so romantic. <laughs> it was, it was, with, with the dead. <laughs> Way more fun. <laughs> Do you know? Do you know where I had a, a bit of a fit when I was um, about thirteen? We we emigrated just shortly after. My parents took me to Blackheath, and that's where they bury all the plague victims, mm. and that's why it's called Blackheath. And wow. it's net. Yeah, I know. And we went there. Um, I can't even remember why we were going there. I think it was something to do with emigrating. Um, and we got out of the car, and I remember just like having this icy breeze just and it was a summer day it was actually a long it was what they call an Indian summer so it was a really lovely summer and I just got out and I just said I can't stay here we need to get as far away from here as possible and it wasn't later it wasn't till later in life that I realized that that's where all the plague victims were and wow. um so yeah again I see I've been I've been a wuss since I was <laughs> since a baby obviously so, <laughs> But yeah, yeah, England is yeah. Some of the castles and oh. um, like York, York has an area called the Shambles, um, mm -hmm. which is like it's like straight out of Shakespeare. You know, the, that's where they do a lot of the if they're doing Shakespearean um, plays or TV shows, they'll they'll actually film in either Bath or they'll film at York. And um, I was walking through the Shambles with a, with my friend um, in 2006. And it was like really getting creeped out because it was, you know, she, she wanted to take me to a vegan restaurant there. And wow. I, I should have known, I should have said no straight away. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, so I spent a very uncomfortable hour at this vegan restaurant in the shambles, just looking at shadows the whole time. You know, you know, you're talking about shadow people. That's probably yes. the first place. I saw shadow people and I'm like, oh, this is just creepy. And, you know, you just can't eat when that shit's going on, can you? Yeah. Oh, gosh. No. Yeah, your appetite's gone. For some people, for me, it's like um, I'll put the plate down and start looking about. So, 
Oh yeah, you, so you would have been, you would have loved it. So I can give you a list of places that creep me out if you like, and you can go check them out. Fabulous deal. Well, You've been a professional paranormal investigator for eight years, haven't you? Uh, it's almost, it's 10 years at the end of this year, actually. Oh, 10 years, okay. So, um, so if you wouldn't mind, could you share with, the, with our listeners a past investigation that stood out from the rest due to the phenomena you, you may have experienced and who shared the experience with you? Was the experience a tactile one? Did anyone actually get touched? And which of the senses were were people find was there smell was there did you see something or was it just a, a touch of some type? Um, it's it's probably more centered around this particular location. That of course I can't actually name where it is. It's what we term as undisclosed location. So the owners have asked for me to never mention where it is and what it is. But it had some very very interesting activity. Um, we i've been involved in filming at this location as well so um there's the paranormal investigator series by moonlight media that filmed there and then also uh, i was involved with another series later on called um in tenebris which is in latin for in darkness so it will exploring the darkness side of of the paranormal which was anything from um ouija boards to people who suicide and what happens to their energy afterwards and really meaty kind of stuff like that that um not many people will, will delve into I was very very fortunate to be a part yeah. of it uh but yeah. this location uh seemed to kind of cover all all sort of gamuts of possible paranormal activity. Um, we had people who seemingly just well, were kind of like taken over. So they were themselves before they were in there and suddenly their mood changes, they get angry. They run down the end of the hallway of this particular building for no reason to chase whatever in the complete dark, like as if they could see. Um, we had people who had um, chairs lifted out from underneath them, um, tapping on their toes. Um, I've heard uh, sort of trolleys being wheeled down um, and hard shoe floors and we're the only people in there and there are no trolleys um, mm. it, you know it was it just seemed to have every type you know you had your audible phenomena you had your visual phenomena where people had seen shadows I've seen something um, it was almost like a hand come up to you in, in the dark but then I've gone to, to sort of move my hand away you know in, in defense of it and there's nothing there and it's a quick mm. movement. It's not like a bat or anything. I that would have hit my face. I would have felt something. And it was the only time it happened during the time I was there that night. Um, I was uh, physically affected. And that's only ever happened that one time, which is really intrigued me because it's not happened since or before. And mm. I walked into this location. And as we're walking down this hallway, I suddenly just got really, really tired. And it was silly tired. Like, it was almost like I've been up for three days. I just walked and went, I just need to sleep. And I looked, at my, I just need to sleep right now. And I looked at the floor. Now, the floor was manky as all get out. Like, there's no way I'd be even touching it with my toe, let alone sitting on it or potentially even contemplating lying down on it. And I looked mm. down, like, I, I just need to sleep. And I, I sort of went to kind of lie down. And the friend that was with me at the time said, whoa, whoa, what's going on? I said, I just need to sleep now. I just need right now. I just need to go to bed. He's like, what are you doing? Get up, get up. I'm like, no, I said, there's just a bit of a pain on the back of my neck. But I said, okay, maybe if I just sleep. He goes, no, no, we need to get you out now. Now, that's a common thing that's happened with a lot of males in this location. Um, and mm -hmm. apparently, from what I was told, and I, again, take it with a grain of salt, and it's the only time it's happened, but apparently there was an entity that was trying to latch itself onto me and it does so Ew. through the back of your neck and it was a particular nasty one so but the only it, it was very very strange experience for me it's the only other time it's ever happened um mm -hmm. obviously I, w I was taken out of the location as soon as i got out i was like a wide awake as if nothing had happened and I'm like why have i got my energy back why suddenly do i feel like i can do cartwheels it's, it was the strangest experience I went back in and I felt a little bit tired, but nothing like it was before. So, yeah, I've had a lot of mediums saying that, you know, that's that's a sign of something trying to take over you. So well, that's a bit interesting. But, again, it's um, never happened Scary. before, never happened since. Yeah, but this location just uh, was incredible. It was incredible. It's not there anymore, unfortunately. Um, 
it was wow. not has been knocked down um and it's been something that's been rebuilt in its place good luck living there but anyway <laughs> it's not my <laughs> problem i should drop over some pamphlets <laughs> so so i take it it was a private dwelling of some type yes yeah mm -hmm. and victoria based or uh, new south based? wales I want to know how I protect myself before I do any of the stuff I do? Yes, of course. I would love to. Oh, good. Well, I imagine, do you know, have you both seen David at in Florence? Um, you know, the statue of David? Oh, yes. I Not once had. Person. Oh, okay. I once spent three hours sitting on the ground just staring up hit at, up at his butt to be honest and it was amazing that three hour period <laughs> one, of, one of those experiences in life that everyone should do I think so anyway <laughs> David as most people would know is like a, the epitome of the perfect man and um, I just imagine David with wings and coming up behind me and putting his wings around me and that's my protection so it's so much nicer <laughs> than, than imagining like golden light <laughs> and stuff so. That would be something I wouldn't mind wrapping myself in either. I think I'd, I love I love your uh, your alternative view on it, and I think it's a great idea. <laughs> yes, Bevan, it's it's got a bit of a sexual nature to it too. <laughs> so watch out for that. But it, it's just another I, type of energy. <laughs> it, it is, and uh, and that's what the astral is all about. I'm told by Greg Doyle that that's all sexual energy up there. So just be careful. <laughs> so. <laughs> Is, it, is that Sheila laughing too? Because she knows it all too well. <laughs> Sheila damn near chokes you. <laughs> I had to get myself a cough lolly. <laughs> Sorry about that. So that <laughs> Why do you think some ghosts stick around after death, whilst the majority of people who die kind of move on or reincarnate or, you know, is there any other option? I don't know. Yeah. So why do you think some just don't want to go? Yeah, I think it's it's about intention. I think a lot about energy is about intention. And I think if energies want to stay, you know, they're going to want to stay. And, and I'm, you know, as I mentioned before, it doesn't necessarily mean of due to having unfinished business, it can be, you know, maybe they, the way in which they, they passed over, they don't know they've passed over. I, I, you know, over the years, I've spoken to mediums who have said, you know, this entity that's it's causing havoc in your house thinks he's still alive. It's his home. He doesn't realise he's actually passed on. So sometimes it can be really quick when they pass. Or or maybe it's, it's an entity just wants to be with somebody and, and still feels guilty about the way in which they pass. Sometimes, and there have been one or two occasions, and it's very rare that, you know, someone who's taken their own life will then, once they pass over, have enormous regret. Um, and that's really interesting because, you know, you think, well, you know, the consciousness moving on and then the consciousness for action taken, you know, taking their life, then they're going to have regret afterwards. Um, it's all different reasons from what I've been told is, is the reason why an entity will choose to stay. I mean, you've got to think about if it's, you know, the other side's meant to be so great, great you know, why why would you want to stay around? <laughs> it's like, yes. you know, it's, it's yes. really lovely. Just, I don't get it. You know, it must be. It, but then again, you know, we, we're, we've all got choice here. You know, on on this or in this planet, in this world, um, and I would imagine, you know, that consciousness goes with that person if that happens, and they they've got choices there too. I, I wonder if it's the fear of what lies ahead too, because a lot of people fear fear death, and um, although most people, if they if they have a long illness or that, get to the point where they accept death and move on whereas if it's done violently and quickly you know is could there also be the fact that people don't realize they're dead you know oh, yeah. it's just, yeah. so I, I've, I've often wondered if that also plays plays a role in how why some ghosts do stick around because and i do notice when when ghosts you know famous ghosts all seem to have died horribly in some way you mm -hmm. know um if you look at the, you know, all the places that, you know, reporter goes, you know, they, they've been hung or, or drowned as a witch or something like this. And um, 
you know, and I, I went to St Helena. Have you ever done a investigation on St Helena Island at all? No, there? I've heard I've heard of it. I've heard of it, but no, I haven't. I got I I sillily agreed to do one, and I you know you actually have to get a it's like an a, an hour barge ride from the port to the island, and I couldn't get off this island for three hours. So it's one of those I couldn't get away from. So even though I wanted to run, I was stuck on the island for three hours, <laughs> and I had to. But I had to actually suck it up that night and, and do, you know, and, you know, I experienced um, a hanging in because it was a it was a penal colony at, at 1.2. And um, we, were, we were sitting down and I actually, you know, it was the weirdest thing. I kind of couldn't breathe. I felt like I was choking at one point. And oh, wow. I was, you know, I was sitting under a window in this 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 building which is deteriorated didn't have a roof and that on and as as um Gemma Gemma was uh, uh what's her name I forgot her surname um she was she was talking about um you know the building we were in and it ended up being where um the, the window I was sitting under was the hanging window and I was like oh I, of all the places to sit like there's like you know 60 windows I had to sit under the hanging window it was <laughs> Just, yeah, it was like I was a beacon, you know, come come and do this to me. So, but the weird thing, when I got on the barge later, I went to the toilet and I undid my 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 scarf, which had been around my, it was freezing night. I had had it on all night and I had grease around my neck. Oh, wow. Yeah, oh, so wow. that's a bit weird, isn't it? So I, and I don't, yeah. don't know how it got there because I hadn't taken, it was, it was like really cold and I hadn't taken off anything. You know, well, it's a strange location to have anything like that because we don't put things around our necks usually. You know, if it's it's that's a very strange spot to have something like that. You know, that kind of substance be there. It's intriguing. I thought so too, and it was like it was like a black grease kind of. You know, and I remember thinking, what the hell? You know, I hadn't, and I'm not a. I've always had a thing about my wearing things around my neck. I've never liked to wear things around my neck. I don't know why. Something past lifey, no doubt. She, um, mm -hmm. Sheila would probably um, confirm that. And um, but this night, I did actually the first time in ever really. I had this scarf wrapped around quite tightly. But um, yeah, I don't know how the grease got there. It was very awful. When I got in the barge, and I was like, oh, thank God I'm off that island. <laughs> <laughs> but you should, Beth, if you ever come up here, we'll do, there's a, there's a few places, you and I, and maybe get Rick in on it, and we should all go and, yes. like, do do a weekend of it, like, make the Friday night Bobo Road, Saturday night on the, the on the island, and then the Sunday night down at the, 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 the submarine, and see if we can keep, we should try and, the goal should be to try and keep me at the location for more than 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're on. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>
in your private and residential cases when you're trying to help somebody out with problems in their home because that's a whole level of seriousness compared to what it'd be like investigating you know say at Bogo Road Jail you know that that's finding out you know what's there you know is it going to communicate is there some equipment you might want to try is there other other things you might want to try it's a very laid back way of, of investigating it's, and it's more about yourself it's more about finding answers for you but with private and residential or domestic cases uh, it's a whole level of seriousness it's not about you at all it's actually helping somebody who's having a, a, some serious problems and they need some help finding out what's actually going on so it's actually more about them and it's and it's a whole other different things like we've mentioned before with mental health could drug use also be involved you've got to eliminate these things as much as you can before you start to look at the phenomena and and find out what could actually be going on so you know, there's no official formal training for, for this type of investigating. And that's the biggest problem because there's there's also ethical issues with that too. If if there yes. actually isn't anything legitimately paranormal going on, this person might be dealing with a mental health issue. You're further um, hurting that person from getting help by, you know, indulging in those delusions and in those audible visual hallucinations. And it's and that has happened in the past. It's particularly in America. I've heard of it happening here in Australia, but I've never obviously been witness to it myself. I wouldn't want that, but it's that's a big, big risk. It's um, there was one case in America where somebody actually um, went into a group, went into a paranormal, um, take, took on a paranormal case with with somebody in their home. Um, they said that it was haunted, and that they needed to get out. So the family then sold their home and moved. And then the people that moved into that place had no problems whatsoever. Um, the other people that had moved out had found out um, and then actually went to sue the paranormal group because they lost money on the sale on the house because they said it was haunted and it, to them it wasn't. The other family were fine. Mm -hmm. So that's happened in America already. That's my biggest fear of it happening here in Australia because it's really difficult to say that place is haunted. And, of course, then advising somebody to sell and move is you just don't. So there's, there's this, you know, there's nothing that 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 um is sort of legalized us in that way to be able to protect us as investigators, but also people who who want to reach out because they do have issues in their home and they want actual genuine help. So as as far as training, it's really down to the individual. It's 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 there's so many different investigation styles. You know, there's some teams that are really into the whole history side of it. They really love the history of a location and, and what happened there to help explain paranormal activity. Um, others are really into the whole tech side, the whole gadgets. They like to be able to see if there's ways to record and detect, you know, the environmental changes that happen in a location. Um, you know, there are some that are very much mediumship based. They're very much about uh, moving a spirit entity on as opposed to detecting whether it's there or not. They know and they can feel it and they want to help move it on so those people can have a better experience in their homes. So, there are many different styles mm. of investigating too. I think that also drives what direction people will go in for the learning material. A lot of people do learn um, out in the field per se. You know, people do go to events or they'll go to um, or take on cases. Preferably, if you're going to take on those private residential cases, you've got some a decent amount of experience before that because they are a, a, different, a, a different level of serious. But, yeah, it really does depend. Uh, there isn't anything set. Um, that's why I get really passionate about having something that can be accessible to everybody around the world, but also something that's not faith-based, that's actionable stuff that people can actually take out into the field and use as opposed to just knowing about poltergeists or just knowing that this is what a shadow person looks like and this is where we think it comes from. Well, that's great, awesome, fantastic. What happens if you see one? What happens if you see one if you're doing a private case? Or what happens if you see one and someone else sees it and you're in Bogger Road Jail? You know, what do you do then? How would you find out more about what, what you've seen? So that's where I come in and that's where my mm. biggest passion is. Well... That's all for our podcast. Thanks for listening. And remember, if you want to support what we do, then share, subscribe, and leave a positive review over on iTunes for the open-minded skeptic. My team and I look forward to entertaining you once again in our next podcast. To check when our next podcast is, simply head over to www.tomspod.com. That's www.tomspod.com.